Okay, um, my name is Reed Cunningham. I'm actually the patent attorney for the university. There's two of us at the moment, but there's soon will be one. Um, my background is um, I've come from four years of private practice, uh, 16 years in industry. I worked for Xerox. Um, I've done quite a bit of prep and prosecution for patents, um, patent assertion, patent defense against other companies. For anyone who's ever done manufacturing, we spent a couple of years doing what's called uh, the insect video, which is process research, um, and we brought that to the new department. Um, spent four years overseas doing quite a bit of um, international IP work uh, with Xerox for all of Europe, and supporting the uh, research organization, and then coming back to the United States, and I joined uh, U of R in January. So, um, bring quite a bit of different kinds of experiences to this. Uh, the reason for this, this series really arose out of a discussion of what do um, professors and junior faculty and graduate students need in terms of skills and intellectual property um, as we move forward because the world has changed quite a bit. Um, and there are a set of new realities. There are, there are not as many faculty positions as there used to be. Um, there, there's a bit of a blood of PhDs, which is one way to describe it. Companies are cutting back on their research and development. And funding for all kinds of research is flat at best and in many cases small. So what do we do to prepare everybody for this new reality? How do we best react? And so our thought is these are a set of skills and education and learning um, and trying to focus really on practical ways that would be very helpful whether you stay here at the university, whether you're going off and taking a different faculty position, or if you're going into industry, these are things that are going to be very practical and useful for you. So we really hope that you come to the entire series. Um, okay. So, um, I think we've already you've seen the slide, we've got all of these going on, but again, it's supposed to give you a real broad scope and I think all of these will really contain material that will be helpful to you as you move forward in your careers. Okay. So, the first, and what's going to be today, is the basics of intellectual property. And just to give you an overview, I think often um, people don't recognize the differences and the overlaps among the different kinds of intellectual property. Um, a lot of this kind of presentation comes from work that I've done with senior executives and engineers and all kinds of people who, who have to manage intellectual property as part of their job. So I think you'll find this very helpful at a practical level. Okay, why does IP matter? Well, if you look at a university, and if you look more and more at a modern company, intellectual property is really the value and heart of that company. Um, for most commercial enterprises, it's the intellectual property they own, and it's the intellectual capital of the people who work for them. So if you look at the biggest companies and the fastest growing companies in the United States right now, take Apple, um, they don't own any manufacturing. They do, own a, they do own a campus and a few research facilities. But effectively what makes Apple so valuable is their intellectual property, which is their, their copyrights and trade secrets and know-how and trademarks and patents, all of that together, plus the intellectual capital of people who work for that company. That's the vast majority of their value. Their physical assets are actually quite tiny compared to the rest of that. And even companies like here in Rochester, Xerox, um, has gotten rid of its manufacturing, has gotten rid of its headquarters, has gotten rid of all those kind of things. Its company value, like a lot of companies now, is the intellectual pro property that it holds and the people who work for it. And that's the world we live in. Just to give you an example, um, General Motors employs 212,000 people, and there are roughly another 200,000 people who work for suppliers whose jobs 100% depend on General Motors. Um, so you've got roughly 400,000 people in 157 countries working on five continents to create 9 million vehicles. Their market capitalization is $56 billion. That's kind of the old world. They've got factories, they've got supply chains, they've got all these things. We've got WhatsApp. Anyone have WhatsApp on their phone? A couple of you? I have it on my phone. My daughter just went to McGill this year to start. Uh, she's in Canada. It's expensive to text her, but I can take this app on my phone. I can text her for free. 
on WhatsApp, uh, bought by Facebook recently, founded in 2009, has 55 employees. 55 compared to 200,000, really 400,000. They have 400 million users and growing. When I downloaded my app, there are well over 500 million downloads. This is actually slightly out of date. They sold for $19 billion. They have no physical assets. They have no corporate headquarters. They have no factory. They have nothing. They are in a rented office space for 55 people. Knowing how startups work, they don't even own the computers that people use. Those are all rented. Okay. Their biggest asset is the software for the program, the trade secret of their 400 million users. That's why Facebook wanted them. 400 million users. That's a trade secret. Okay. Their intellectual capital is 55 people. They're worth 19 billion dollars. Okay. So you can see the difference. How much it takes in the old world to generate value. How much it takes in the new world. This is a purely intellectual property company. Purely intellectual property. $19 billion in five years. Okay. So, what makes intellectual property different? The great thing about intellectual property is it can be replicated at little or no cost. Every time General Motors wants to build another car, it has to get all those supplies and all those components to a factory and create another car. If it wants to make a million more cars, it's got to build entire new factories, it has to create entire new supply lines, it has to get all of that together to create a million new cars. When Microsoft wants to make a million extra copies of Windows, it does nothing because it's essentially a free operation. Someone, you can just go down, and so a million more people download Windows. It has no additional cost. That's the power of intellectual property. Once you cover it the first time, you're pretty much set. Okay? Um, it can also be used by many people at the same time. Physical property, things like real estate, real property, which is buildings and land, or what we call personal property, things like anything that's small enough you can move it, automobiles and chairs and pencils and everything else we own. Okay? Most of that stuff, only one person can use at a time. Okay? I can sit in this chair, and you can sit in this chair, but we can't sit in the chair at the same time. On the other hand, if I have a patent, I can license all of you to use the patent. I can license this group to use it in healthcare if I want. I can license this group to use it in Europe if I want. And I can license it a different way to everyone over here. So you can divide it, and you can multiply it, and you can work with it. So it has tremendous value in that sense. It's that malleability that many, many people can use it at the same time. Okay? So, all right, so let's talk about it. Kinds of intellectual property. Okay? Copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets or know-how, and patents. So we'll go through all four, and I have some, some suggestions and best practices for each of the four. Okay? So we'll start with copyrights. Copyrights is creative expression, and we tend to think of them in the traditional world of artworks, films, photographs. That's kind of the classic category of... There's no clock in here, I'm going to be driven nuts. Um, these are the classic areas. In the business world, it covers things like writings, manuals, documentation, software. The most important area of copyright now is software. Um, if you come at the very last of this series of presentations, it's going to be all on software. It's really worth coming, even if, um, even if you're not a software engineer, if you manage software, if you do anything that touches software, there's going to be a tremendous amount of good information there. But software is the most important, but technical drawings and maths works. It's something that is the expression of an idea. So it's worth taking a moment to talk. An idea itself is not copyrightable. But the expression of the idea is copyrightable. So I can think of an idea of a young girl walking through a forest. It's an idea. The expression of the idea might be Goldilocks, or it might be Little Red Riding Hood. Each of them are expressions. And because those are sort of old ideas, you could have, I could have a story about Goldilocks. You could have a different story about Goldilocks. Each of them are expressions of the idea 
of a young girl who goes to someone's house and can't decide what she wants to do. Okay? Each of those is independently copyrightable. Okay? So it's that expression, not the idea itself. And so sometimes it's, it, it's hard to tease apart that subtle one. With a copyright, you get, a, you get exclusivity. Exclusive right to create copies. That's why it's called copyright. The right to make copies um, of the expression of the idea. It also includes the right to modify, create derivative works, distribute all of those things. Okay, so a, de a derivative work, which is a good idea to understand, is something that's based on the original copyright. So the classic example is if I write a book, and we translate it into a different language, that's considered a derivative work. It's derived from the original. Okay. Derivative works can also include, if I decide to write a story about a young wizard, and I decide to name him Harry Potter, and he liked to live under the, the, in the cupboard under the stairs, that derives from um, G.K. Rowling's book. Okay. So she actually owns the right in that. It's a derivative work. It derives from. Okay. Um, it's only against unauthorized copying. The strength of copyright is that it's cheap and easy to get. It's actually quite powerful. But its limitation is it's only against copying. It does not prevent independent creation. So if we go back to WhatsApp, they have software that allows, um, allows you to text across country lines without being charged. Okay, and there's some understanding how you do that. I could go, if I got the right software engineers, we could sit down and we could write brand new code that does that same function. Okay? That code is not an infringement of copyright because it's independently created. It does not derive from. So the idea is I can text across country lines. The expression may be one set of code that WhatsApp uses we could have a second set of code that we create ourselves. Okay, they're different expressions of the same idea, and they are independent of each other. One is not an infringement of the other. Okay? So the weakness of copyright is that um, without any other protection available, let's see, patent doesn't apply or something else, you can create, again, on your own, um, a, new, a new work, and it doesn't infringe. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. One of the things I love about copyright is conceptually in law, it is what's called a springing right. Patents and to, a, and to a large extent trademarks are rights you have to perfect. You actually have to go to the government and do something to get rights. Copyright's kind of fun. If you create something, if you sit down and write, if you go, you know, and be it music or code or whatever it is, at the moment of creation there springs into being rights in that work. So they exist from the moment of creation. So, you know, you always hear the story of someone who finds the diary from a hundred years ago and it was stuck behind the wall. In that, there's copyright because it sprang into being at the moment. Okay. Now, what we do is we register copyrights because you get additional rights when you register with, with the government. And those are quite powerful rights and you want to register. But you actually have rights from the moment of creation. Okay? Uh, registration is great because it gives you what are called statutory rights. So often if there's an infringement of your copyright, the statutory rights are terrific because they don't require you to show damage or loss. You just get money. Uh, it's typically $10,000 per copy. So whenever you see the music download suits and they're suing some you know, poor college student for you know, $500 million, what has happened is they posted the song and it got downloaded, you know, 5,000 times. 5,000 downloads, $10,000 of damages per download. You do the multiplication and you get some pretty phenomenal numbers. So in that sense, copyright's great. So registering copyright is terrific. And even better, you get all that protection for the grand total of $35. Although it may have gone to 55. Actually, Laura, do you remember what's it gone up to? Ooh, it's 65. Still, it's a bargain. If you've ever hired a lawyer to do anything, this is the cheapest thing in the world. And it's one page form, you can fill it out yourself. Really simple, great protection. Um, 
varies around the world, but copyright protection is also quite long. Uh, we can thank the, um, Disney and the um, children of Irving Berlin. They've lobbied relentlessly over the years to extend the copyright so that they can maintain uh, their, their revenue streams. But it's basically life of the author. It's, it's life of the author plus 75, depends on the country, some are plus 100. But it's a very, very long time. So for most of us, if you get copyright protection, it's our lifetimes plus whatever. Okay? But a very nice uh, kind of protection. All right, best practices. You should register because it's cheap and easy. One page, 65 bucks, easy to do. Um, you should be really careful, though, when you copy or transfer because you could put yourself subject to that lovely $10,000 um, damages. You don't want to be in that position. Um, and most of the time, where you're most at risk in most times is software. Okay, software is where people tend to get into the biggest problem. And again, if you come at the last of the series, there can be a lot of discussion of this. Um, and the last bit is if you ever go out and if you're either working with someone or if you go out into industry and you're working with software developers, you brought in some consultants to write code, or you're working with people, you want to make sure that you obtain the rights from them in whatever copyright material they generate. Now, there is a concept of what's called work for hire. So if I come and hire you to write code, theoretically, I own the copyright in that. But if you come with some code that you've already written and incorporate it, because you didn't do it for me, it wasn't a work for hire, I may not have rights in that. So you've got to be very careful. Almost all intellectual property rights, you want to have an agreement in place to make sure that you're getting the rights for what you're doing. Okay, so if you're in a company and you think you're going to get software, or do I have rights to distribute it? Do I have rights to reproduce it? What rights do I have? For all of these, that's critical. There's a whole, we're going to do a whole discussion called working with third parties that's going to go into all of that kind of stuff you worry about. Okay, so good, good, good advertisement for that. Okay, trademarks. Um, trademarks, second classic area, they identify the source of a good or service. They also tell you something about it. So literally the mention of the name will tell you something about a good or service. Okay? So I can say Kia, and you'll have in your head a certain kind of car, where it comes from, maybe some values around it. And I can say Rolls Royce. Okay. All I've said is Kia and Rolls Royce, and in your head already you've got a distinction between, you know they're automobiles, you have a distinction between them, maybe one's economical and reliable, the other's really expensive but fancy, whatever it might be, that trademark carries a whole bundle of associations with it. They're tremendously powerful, and those associations have taken incredible investment over time to build up. So famous names are actually incredibly valuable. Okay? I know for Xerox, um, the last estimate was the Xerox name itself was worth $2 billion. The amount of money it would take to get the vast majority of people in the world to hear a name and associate something with it is, is incredible. So it's worth $2 billion to be able to make that association. Okay? One of the things you have to be careful about is um, trademarks can lose that identification of source or goods. Um, these are names that used to be trademark names. Escalator, Aspirin, and Thermos in the United States used to all be trademark names. They used to identify that it came from a particular company. Um, and what happened is over time, the name got used generically to describe that good. So, you know, we think of aspirin now as it's aspirin. It, didn't, it doesn't say it comes from Bayer. It's interesting, if you go other places in the world, Bayer still has a trademark in aspirin. You'll see it capitalized. And the only thing that says aspirin is that bottle which comes from Bayer. But here in the United States, aspirin applies to, I always forget what, whatever the acid is that you take. Okay? Same with escalator. It's moving stairs. It's a generic term for moving stairs. Thermos is kind of fun, because thermos is one of those that's sort of in between. Here I have thermos with a lowercase t. It's generic for, for basically uh, a bottle that keeps things hot or cold. If I gave it a capital T, it would represent that it came from a particular company. So the next time you're at you know, Target or something, go look in that section. You'll see some things are described as a thermos. They'll have a description of it, and we'll use a lowercase. And then you can find the thermos bottles. 
with a capital T and a nice registered trademark sign. Okay, because they're kind of in between. Okay, so if you use capital T, it represents that company. Lowercase, it's just something that uh, describes the good. Okay, um, trademarks are protected by registering by country. You have to register in every country. Worldwide marks tend to be registered everywhere. Coca-Cola is registered in every trademark um, office of the world because it's known everywhere, it's valuable everywhere. Um, but it is on a country by country basis. Um, you can only enforce in a country where you've actually acquired rights by registration. Um, and what's interesting, if you go back, places uh, like Coca-Cola and some other companies, as they grew and as the world economy grew, in some cases, people would go and register their trademarks who were not the company. They would basically squat on the rights and then either try to sell them or they would, they would um, make money off the fact that they could use the same name. So for a long time, I think it was South Africa. If you went and got a bottle of Coke in South Africa, you didn't actually get from the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. Someone else had, had squatted on those rights and was selling this thing called Coke. Okay, so it's on a country by country basis. So if you're ever in a position where you're going to be operating worldwide, how have I protected my rights everywhere? Uh, trademark is nice. Unlike copyrights, unlike patents, there's no limitation to the length that the rights exist. As long as you continue to use it in a commercial purpose, you can have that right forever. So Coca-Cola has been around 125 years, I think, something along those lines. I can guarantee 75 years from now they will still be around. It'll still identify that brown fizzy drink. Um, so they'll be 200 years old, they could be 300 years old. It doesn't matter as long as you continue to use it for the good and service. Um, so in, in that sense it's a very powerful um, kind of intellectual property. Okay. Cop uh, trademarks are kind of fun too because not only do they identify a good and service, but they identify a particular good and service. So you can have the same name used for different goods and services. So the one at the very top, anybody here? That delta, what's that represent? Airline. Airline. Okay, it represents an airline. <coughs> they fly you places. The second one down? Anyone? Yep, faucets. If you remodeled your house, those are delta faucets. And, and for me, I'm kind of a bit of a gearhead, and I have a shop. Anyone recognize the one on the bottom? Delta tools. They sell like planers and drill presses and stuff like that. So all three of those delta names are registered. And interestingly enough, they're also re they're registered for the name relative to a good and service. This is for tools. It'll also be registered for the color. It'll be registered for the font that they use. And it'll be registered for the symbol. So they will actually get trademark protection on all of those. And you can even get trademark protection on how something is packaged. So if you, ever, if you go and look in the trademark office, there is a beautiful registration for the Coca-Cola bottle. That silhouette. Only Coca-Cola can use that silhouette. Because okay? it, it's an indicator of their product. Okay? All right. So best practices. Um, if you ever do a startup, one of the most important things you'll do is pick a name. Often people pick a name, get going, and then realize, oh my god, someone else is already using that name. Uh, there's something called a clearance search. You can go out, Google's actually amazing. You can just put the name in and see what comes up. Is someone using that same name for the same goods and services that you really want to hire someone to work with? Uh, the more distinct and fanciful the name, the better off you are. Kodak was always considered one of the classic examples. It's a completely made up name. Okay? Completely fanciful and made up for photographic, um, for film. Okay? So it actually is very powerful because it didn't come from anywhere. Everyone likes to use initials. Those are terrible trademarks. Okay? Or because you might discover that your um, your company uh, is the International Society for I'm not going to remember. It's the International Society for something. But when you abbreviate it, it's ISIS, which is not a lovely name to have at the moment. So they're frantically trying to change their name. Okay. So not a big fan of using um, initials. Um, you shouldn't use anyone else's. And for us here, tend not to think about it. The University of Rochester is a registered trademark. Our symbol, our name, 
it gives a tremendous amount of information about the institution, the quality, all kinds of things about ourselves. We should protect that mark. And we should be careful when we use it, and you should be sure that you are authorized to use it. Okay, because sometimes we'll work with other universities or other companies or something else, and it's a real decision about whether we let them use our name or not. Because if we let someone use the U of our name, and they do something bad, it makes us look bad. So we need to really protect our mark. And we have to be careful with that. Okay? So for us, even today, it actually matters quite a bit trademarks. It's an incredibly valuable trademark. Okay? All right. I'm losing the time lines here. Ooh, I'm rocking you more. You're doing pretty well. Okay. Um, oh, and I forgot to say, if you have questions, you should not hesitate to ask them in the middle. Uh, I didn't tell you, I started out as a high school physics teacher. Yes, I love having questions during the discussion. Yes. So, uh, the name of the company also trademarks. For example, uh, we have Spark and Candle. They have products that are just had and showers. Yep. The so had and showers is a trademark. Yes. So, Yes, they're also trademarks. All of those are trademarks. So they will have trademarks on um, their, the, the umbrella company, but then they'll have it on each of the product lines. And it's amazing, actually. It's a good question because it turns out that long after you stop making a product, people will recognize the name. So um, the car companies are very careful. All their old model names, they continue to make every year a couple of things labeled with those names so that they don't lose the rights to them. You know, I, don't, you know, I don't think, I really don't think General Motors wants to make another Corvair, but they continue to own the rights to it. Um, but old trademarks actually worth something. My favorite example is, I'm not sure if it was Procter & Gamble, but it was, one of the, um, it was one of the companies that makes, you know, sort of personal products. Um, they had a bunch of old trademarks, and they're like, what are we gonna do with these things? They're no good. So they sold them really cheap to somebody. And I think it was Downey was the name. But for a long time, you couldn't buy Downey toilet paper because it went out of the market. But someone realized that, of course, you know, Walmart and um, you know, Costco and all these companies, they sell generic goods, and they're just generically named. But you could buy a really cheap old trademark and put it on the generic product and sell it, and it sold better. So you can go to a lot of the big box stores now. You can buy Downey toilet paper. It's just generic toilet paper. But people recognize the name Downey and they have a bunch of associations with it. Okay, so tell when you hear it, you're like, oh, that's toilet paper. That's nice toilet paper. I'll buy some of that. Over the generic stuff that's next to it, you get to charge a couple cents more per, per roll. It's all free money. So don't underestimate the power of trademarks. Uh, now all those companies are much more careful <laughs> not to sell their trademarks because suddenly they discovered they had, their, they had a competitor in their midst that they didn't expect. Okay. Um, Trade secrets and know-how. This is not an area that people traditionally, people typically think of when they think of intellectual property. However, often this may be the most valuable kind of intellectual property. When I talked about WhatsApp, they have a very nice program that lets you text. However, their real asset is 400 million users. Okay? That's a trade secret. The, only they know who the 400 million users are and they have access to them. Okay? So if we were to look at their assets, it's a trade secret that is a huge amount of their value. Okay? $14 billion company, probably $13.5 billion or more is those 400 million usernames. And you know, the fact that you've got their phone number and everything else. Okay? So uh, business, business and technical information not publicly known. Okay? It's basically the known part. It's confidential. Okay, so all the value in trade secrets comes from the fact that not everybody knows it. Okay, it's the confidential nature that gives it value. Okay. So, um, for business, we tend to think of that it could be pricing, could be customer lists, supplier lists, program names, launch dates, org charts, business methods, legal opinions. On the technical side, could be processes, formulations, software, technical drawings, research. Okay. Often when we go out and license, we, want to, we, will, we will license a bundle of IP rights. So we often talk about, let's say, licensing a patent. But typically we're, we're licensing the patent plus a certain amount of know-how and trade secret that goes along with it. And it's really the combination of the two that's valuable. So let me give you an example. 
uh, we may create a new material on a lab bench. And it has certain properties. And you go, well, those are really kind of interesting properties. I can make some products with that that people would get excited about. It wears longer, it's harder, it does whatever it does. But when I make it on the lab bench, my yield rate to make that is 5%. And everyone's like, well, that's great, but I can't throw away 95% and make any money. Okay. Now, so I got a patent on this great material, but my yield rate's 5%. I spend a bunch more time and I learn how to get the yield rate up to 90%. Okay. I haven't really created any inventions, but I understand how better to work with it, how to create it, how to, how to make, this new, make this material. That ability to make it at 90% is the trade secret. Okay. That's incredibly, incredibly valuable because a company will come in and say, at 90%, I'm pretty sure I can actually take what you've done and in a more controlled setting, get 95. I can make a lot of money at 95% yield rate. So the patent is important because it's for the material, but without that trade secret of knowing how to make it so I get a big yield rate, it doesn't have any, money, it doesn't have any value. So often it's that combination of the two, when we think about licensing out, that makes it valuable. Okay. So all of these are the kind of things we worry about. Those trade secrets, they give you better pricing, they may go to marketing, they could go to your technology, product performance, product delivery, okay? market presence. All of these, all those trade secrets will help you okay, compete. Okay, they will help you compete. And so you don't want your price list out there because your competitor, if they knew your exact price list, would come in and undercut you 5% on everything and take every sale of yours. Okay? You don't want that, so you keep your price list um, a trade secret. It might be your marketing strategy. Okay? What's the biggest product launch that we had in the last couple weeks? IPhone 6. iPhone 6. Anyone stand in line to buy one? Okay. What's great about the iPhone 6 is that um, its entire marketing strategy, when was it going to launch? What features was it going to have? What was its technical specifications? All those things, nobody knew. It was really exciting. We didn't know what they were going to be. Those were all trade secrets. Okay. And they were protected very diligently by Apple because it gave them a big competitive advantage. Okay. And they actually are aggressive in a good way about protecting their trade secrets. So here's a product that launched and you can go buy. But you know, in order to have it in the store, they had to start making iPhone 6s months ago. So the factory's been churning out iPhone 6s for months. And even long before that, the suppliers to make the parts that went into an iPhone 6 knew it six months to a year ago what parts they needed to supply. And yet, you, none of us knew what was, gonna, what was the iPhone 6 going to do? What was it going to have in it? Because they used the trade secret and the confidentiality which they enforce through agreements to protect that. And so at the end, they get a big splash and it gives them a big competitive advantage. So it may not be the patents, it may not be the other things, but it's that trade secret and how you bundle it and what you do with it that creates value. Okay. So trade secret best practice. Um, you maintain confidentiality at all times. So if you have something that's valuable, you protect it. Okay. You share with people minimum necessary. Often, I will get people to come in and say, oh, we signed an NDA, I can give them everything. An NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. Don't do that. Because agreements are great after things go wrong. But only give people what the minimum that they need to work with you. Okay? Wherever that is. Um, you do want to have an agreement in place because that's an enforceable mechanism to make sure they protect your information. If you don't have an agreement in place and you give them something, they're under no obligation. They can put it on the web. Everybody can see it. Okay, so you want to have agreements in place for what you think is valuable. Marking things confidential helps a lot, too. If nothing else, when you go back to court, you can say, I marked it confidential. They should have known better. That's actually true. Um, understand your obligations. Okay, if you are, have signed a non-disclosure agreement, you may have obligations. And you don't want to violate. So often you have to be careful. People always want to run off and sign these agreements. And it's like, well, do you understand what the consequences of that are? What are the obligations? And this is the most important, particularly in a research university. 
When you sign a non-disclosure agreement, you get information from the other party that they want to have kept secret. If you base your new research in any way on that information, you violated the confidentiality agreement. If you see trade secret information, you may not be able to do research in that area, which is a tremendous loss. One of the things that we do is we are very protective of your right to continue research. So we really want to see all those non-disclosure agreements that come in, because you, we don't want you to be limited. Okay, and that's, that's a risk. That's a, that's a real and serious risk to development. To do research. Who, can, who can sign NDAs? Oh, you can. <laughs> Let me start with that. Um, as a practical matter, the professors can't sign the NDAs. Can or cannot? Cannot. Okay? It's got to be signed by an authorized person from the university, because it's actually the university agreeing for the employee. Um, so I'm allowed to sign NDAs. My old job actually doesn't like that. Um, it would, I'd actually, I don't know in every case. You'd actually have to go back and see who's authorized. Um, I actually have a specific letter from, I think, Gail, saying that I, ha I have authority to sign those kind of agreements and bind the university. But essentially, you have to have authority to bind the university, which is actually quite a small number of people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? Could you please give uh, a specific example of so how the NDA can limit Sure. Let me, let me get real examples, because these happen all the time. Um, two companies are going to work together. And I'll try to make up, uh, we're going to do research, we're going to create a, um, we're going to create a new bicycle. Okay. And um, company A comes in and they understand how gears work. And I look at, and, I, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting how these gears work. You know, I can create a new derailleur that makes shifty automatic. You don't have to move the lever anymore. Oh, that's really cool. But you signed an NDA and said anything they gave you, you can't, you can't use other than for the purpose. Maybe it's to work together. I can't now go get a patent or do work on a derailleur because I've been contaminated. It's literally the word we use. You've been contaminated with information. And the hard part is, if you go off and now do something, like file a patent or do something else, they're going to run back and say, it's based on my confidential information, and you have to prove the negative. I have to prove the negative that I didn't use their information to do my further research. And let me tell you, it is incredibly difficult to prove a negative. <laughs> I didn't use that. I came up with that on my own. Really? Because it was sitting right in front of you. You didn't use that, really? Okay. Um, those are terrible cases. You usually lose them. Yes? So when we sign an NDA with a company, for example, we write a proposal together. Yeah. And we contribute our own part of doing research. And company also provides some part. But we yep. sign an NDA, particularly we have a third party, money for Google. Well, well, what, it, what it often comes down to is the terms that are in that NDA. So, for example, most of our good terms, we will say that um, for purposes of this agreement, we can continue to use your confidential, confidential information for research and development purposes. So if you go on and write more papers and do more research, they can come in and go, oh, it's based on mine. The answer is, that's fine. Grievance says we can do that. Okay. Or it might be, sometimes what you do, the best thing to do, is that there's a limit. It says after a certain number of years, will no longer consider any of this confidential. Okay? So after maybe two years or three years. Okay? So if you're doing, doing research, yeah, it's based on yours, but we worked together four years ago. It's outside the period of confidentiality. And a lot of it is working with people to understand what's the best way to do this. I've signed deals that had the most rigorous confidentiality terms, but they were only six months long. So you knew the whole problem went away in six months. You could sign that. Other ones have been very long, but then you keep it really narrow because you know that's going to be a problem. And it's a, really a case-by-case -case basis. It's one of those things you really, really need to work with someone to make sure you're doing the right thing for you and your research and, and what you're trying to develop. Okay? And we'll talk more about it. If you come back for the working with third parties, that's, there's going to be a whole section just on NDAs because that's a classic area to have problems. Okay? So is the takeaway that you've never signed anything without? 
consulting you are yeah you, you should not be signing anything you should be either you are ventures or the office of general counsel um, you need someone to take a look at it because you're effectively binding the university and not only are you binding the university but you might be hurting yourself we want to prevent you from hurting yourself okay all right fire away um, you said that you can now sign an NDA without consulting. How about you that just want to confirm? Um, are you a graduate student? Yeah. Yeah, you're considered an employee of the university now. <laughs> At least in terms of that. Now, there are things, if it, if it was outside the scope of you know, being a student or if you're a professor, um, you do have an ability to do some consulting on the side. But that's a personal, you're signing it as an individual, not as, um, as the. Um, as a representative of the university, okay? But you do have to be careful. I've actually had students who've come back and asked us because they've gone to another institution and now asked to sign an NDA. How does that interact with something that they may have done here? Okay, so this can come up in many ways. Okay, any more questions on NDAs? Let's see how we're doing time-wise. I think we're doing okay. Uh, yes? So does an uh, NDA have the time limit, for example, for university employee? Uh, if I leave the university, uh, I'll want, you know, NDA. Um, if, you, if you saw some confidential information and the agreement was that you were going to keep it in confidence for five years, even if you leave the university, the obligation still applies to you. Okay, so another question. Uh, is it negotiable? Uh, Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's a lot of what we do is we don't, you know, we negotiate back and forth and we're trying to, to craft the terms for the situation. Reduce the amount of risk, you know, put you, put you in the best position possible. It's really risk management, okay? But yeah, all terms are, you know, that's the great thing about being a lawyer. We rewrite everything, okay? All right. Um, good, we're, we're at patents, um, so let, let's try and finish strong. Patents? Kind of fun, people don't tend to think of them this way, but it's an exchange. The concept of a patent is that I give a public disclosure to my invention. I don't keep it a trade secret. It's the opposite of a trade secret. I put it out there for everyone to know. In exchange, I get a period of exclusivity. So it's quid pro quo. Okay, so I let everyone know what my technology is, but the reverse is I get a period of exclusivity. So that's kind of how it works. It's also the reason, um, and if you come back to another presentation, I'll talk about prior art. Patents are phenomenal because they are an incredible resource for understanding technology. Because they're a publication of all kinds of technology, and they, they've had people who are very bright catalog it, which is much better than keywords. Okay. What can you patent? Um, we tend to think of patents on things, articles of manufacture, the classic light bulb, um, but methods of manufacture, could be chemical compositions, could be chemical formulation, could be computer programs, um, not universal around the world, but in the US you can still do computer programs, although it's gotten more difficult. Methods of doing business can be patented. Um, designs, which are the aesthetics of an article, have some ability to be patented. Um, other life forms. Uh, there's a classic Supreme Court case that said everything under the sun can be patented. Okay, so it's quite broad. It's not absolute, but it's quite broad. And what's interesting is patents can be overlapping. So I may create something that's completely new. I create the new light bulb. So I could get it on the light bulb. I could get it on the method of making the light bulb. I could get more patents on the chemical compositions of the filaments and the, and the glass and everything else. I could get patents on all those things. I could get it on the computer program maybe that's used to make it or something else. I could even get it on how I sell my light bulb. I could get a patent on how I sell my light bulb. So you can imagine if, if you go into a startup, all the different ways you can have overlapping protection for your company, or all the different ways you can think of it. So sometimes, maybe the composition is old, and I've done this, that composition has been around a long time. It's out in the public domain. But I come up with a new and better way to make it. So I can get a patent on the way of making it. I can't get it on the material, but I can get it on the way of making it. Okay. So there are different ways you can play with what, what's an invention here. Okay. So um, part of it is a little bit of creativity. Okay. So, all right. 
This is, if you leave here today knowing nothing else, nothing else, you forget everything else, wipe your mind of all of this and go, oh my God, I do want you to leave understanding this first sentence, okay? Because this is something that people get so routinely wrong. And, and I've been in meetings with senior executives of companies who don't understand this, and it is really, really important. Okay, a patent holder, if you get a patent, is granted a right to exclude others from making, selling, offering, and sell, importing the invention. It's a right to exclude others from making, using, selling, or offering, and sell. It is not a right, it is not a right to make your own invention. People get this wrong. They'll come in and someone will say, gee, well, you know, we're in a crowded field, um, we've got this new thing. And they're like, gee, do we have to worry about a right to use? What are other people doing? And they'll go, no worries at all, we got a patent on that. Can't believe, you can't believe how many times I've heard that. Don't worry about it, we have a patent on that. Having a patent is useless when it comes to whether I can make and do something. It's a right to exclude others. I'm going to give you a real life example, which will make this much clearer. Someone invented the tubeless tire, okay? Before this, we had a rim, and we had a tire, and we had a tube that went in it. You blew up the tube, and it made it go up, you know, the typical bicycle, okay? Someone invented the tubeless tire. It was kind of a nice invention. You had to reinforce the rim, and it had a special wheel that didn't leak air, and all this, so you didn't have a tube anymore, okay? But you had to have a special rim, and you had to make this special tire, and, you know, at the end of the day, Okay, it was a little better than the tube tire, but not anything terribly exciting. Second company comes along, different company, and invents the radial tire. They understand that if you take the plies of the tire, and instead of just running them around the tire, radial is you run them at an angle, run them across, you end up with this tire that it doesn't expand when it gets hot, and it wears better, and it grips the road better, it does all these really terrific things. That's a really great tire. People want a radial tire. However, a radial tire is a tubeless tire. Radial tires don't work if you have a tube in them. Okay? So they're a tubeless tire. So the question is, can I make my radial tire? The answer is no. Because every time I make a radial tire, I have a patent on a radial tire, but every time I make a radial tire, I'm also making a tubeless tire, which infringes the first company's patent. They have a right to exclude. So they can exclude me from making a tubeless tire. In the real world, what happened is, people understand that making money can be a good thing sometimes. So they cross-licensed each other. The tubeless tire company licensed their patent to the radial. The radial tire company licensed their patent to the tubeless. And they both got to go make radial tires. Of course, they could exclude everybody else. All right? So it's, do you get the concept? It's a right to exclude others. There may be underlying technology that when you make whatever you're doing, or method, or whatever it be, you might infringe someone else's technology that underlies it. Okay? So it's great to have a patent, but it's not the end of the road. So if you leave with nothing else, take that away. Because you will hear this if you ever go out in the real world, <clears throat> where you're actually trying to figure out whether I can make something, or do something. Okay? Um, patents are territorial. You can only enforce them in the country where they get issued. Patents are terrific because they're an absolute right to bar others. Independent creation is not a defense to patent infringement. Even if you independently created it, if it falls within the scope of the patent, scope of the claims, you infringe. It's irrelevant whether you did it, whether you stole it or whether you did it independently. So it's an absolute right. It's very powerful. What's the downside of patents? They're really expensive. You're talking probably ten to twenty thousand dollars each, at a minimum. Probably more. Um, it takes at least three years to get one because the U.S. Patent Office is really slow, and it's just a long process. Okay, so it's expensive and it's slow. Okay, and you might not end up with one fair number of patents you finally end up not getting because there's prior art, there's other reasons why you end up not getting. Okay? But they have that power. 
but you have to file for every country. And you can start to see that it can be really expensive at $20,000 each. You're not going to file everywhere in the world. You're only going to file in a limited number of places because it is so expensive. The only people who file everywhere are pharmaceutical companies because they can sell drugs everywhere and justify it. But for the rest, of, the rest of the world, pretty much you tend to file in the United States because we have the biggest and most robust patent system in the world, and it's actually one of the cheaper ones. Um, and we have a really big market. So the US, Japan, Germany, UK, France, if you think about Europe, and China and India are slowly coming up the ramp, but there's still a lot of questions about enforceability. But those are the big countries that people tend to file. Okay. Um, all right. So. Patent term, 20 years from when you file, okay? The period of exclusivity is 20 years from when you file. Okay, so you file a patent application, it's 20 years, but you don't get any rights until the patent actually issues, okay? We are now in the US a first to file system. We used to be a first to invent system, but first to file is the first person to the patent office with the invention wins. Doesn't matter if you did it first, if they get there first, you lose. Okay, we used to be, we used to have a different system in the U.S., but now we are like the rest of the world, which is actually a good thing here. Um, it's called first to file. So it's one of those things where you don't want to delay. If you have an invention, you don't want to, you don't want to stick it in your drawer and two years later pull it out and go, gee, I wonder if I can do anything with this. First person there. Um, and the other thing you have to be careful of is that public disclosure of your invention before you file destroys patent rights. The rest of the world is what's called absolute novelty. If there's a public disclosure, see this is where we come back to trade secret. You want to keep your inventions as trade secrets before they get filed. Because if they are not trade secrets and they're public, it destroys your right to get a patent. Everywhere in the world, the US still has a little bit of this funny rule that says you have a year, but you won't be able to file anywhere else. Okay. But you still, as a, as a practical matter, you want to keep everything confidential Get your filings into the patent office, and then you can do a public disclosure. Okay, so one of the things we often end up doing is someone comes to us and says, I'm delivering a paper in three days, and I got this really cool thing in it. And we go, <gasps> I got three days to file my, my patent application. Okay, that happens more than I'd like to think. So earlier is better. Yes? No. Now, once it's filed, that's all you need. You don't have to wait for the grant because what it does is it sets a date and says anything that happens afterward is not considered prior art. So all we have to do is get the filing. And it is, now I don't recommend this, but occasionally we, we, do, we, we just literally put a cover letter on your paper and file it. It's a terrible way to do it, but it's better than losing the rights. Yes? So related to that, oftentimes what you want to patent is the outcome of a series of things that should have already been published. This, it's an excellent question, and it's a really difficult area to make a distinction. The rules have changed slightly, which is helpful. It says now that the work you've done prior should not be held as priority against you. Other people's work can be held against you, but not yours. So it does give you an ability to kind of do this chain of development and, and, and still be able to get patents. But it's a fairly technical argument, but uh, not within the scope of the time I have. Okay. Um, to get to the end, I want you to get this idea before you go. There's two requirements for patentability. If you ever look at the patent examination manual, it sits about this thick. If, if you have insomnia that's the perfect cure, can you imagine reading statutes on patents? I mean, it is, it is the most horrifically boring stuff. But there's only two things in there that really matter. There's only really, at the end, two substantive standards for patents. Uh, first, it's called novelty. Is it new? And the second is, is it non-obvious? And the term we use is to someone of ordinary skill in the art, would they think that that change you made, would that be obvious? Oh yeah, anybody could do that. I'm gonna give you a really dumb example, but it'll help explain. We're gonna go way back in time, and the world we're, we're gonna go back to is one where we sat around fires on logs and rocks. Okay, we sat around fires on logs and rocks. And someone decides that, you know, logs and rocks are really kind of not great things to set up because they're really, really hard to move. So they're going to invent the stool. So they have a horizontal seating surface with four downwardly ascending legs. And, and everyone goes, wow, that's a, that's a really cool thing. 
I can pick it up, I can move it around, I can be close to the fire, I can be further away from the fire. So they write up a patent application and send it to the patent office. The patent office gets this thing, looks at it, and goes, gee, in the world of seeding, there were rocks and logs, and now we've got this thing called a stool. Is it new? Well, we've never seen anything like that before. That's really great. And is it not obvious? Well, we've had rocks, rocks and logs. We haven't had anything that looks like this. So we're going to give you a patent for the stool. Next person comes along, looks at the stool, says, I really like that stool, but I'm a big guy. When I sat on it, it broke. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a stool that has five legs. So it's got a horizontal seating surface and five downwardly extending legs. And, it's, and I write up a patent application and I send it to the patent office. The patent office gets my application, looks at it, and says, stool with five legs. Is it new? Yes, it's new. Nobody's got a stool with five legs. Is it non-obvious? Well, we've had a stool with four legs, but we've got five, and it's stronger, and it's got kind of this interesting improvement. We're going to give you a patent for the five-legged stool. Next person comes along who's really big, sits on the five-legged stool, breaks it, and says, I'm going to make a six-legged stool. Builds the six-legged stool, sends the patent application off to the patent office. Patent office gets it, applies its two rules. Rule one, is it novel? Now, we've never seen a six-legged stool before. Applies rule two now. Rule two. Is it non-obvious? Well, we understand that we can make stools stronger by adding legs. So it's really a known extension of the art. To make a stronger stool, we can just add more legs. So the six-legged stool, the seven-legged stool, the eight-legged stool, they all may be new, but they're obvious extensions of the technology. So I'm not going to give you a patent on the six-legged stool. Okay, because we're applying these two rules. Now, this is what makes patent law great. Someone comes along, looks at the stool, and says, you know what? It doesn't need four legs. I'm going to cut off a leg. I'm going to have a three-legged stool. Okay? Sends out their patent application. Three-legged stool. Gets the patent office. Patent office looks at it and says, is it new? It's new. We've never seen a three-legged stool before. Is it obvious. Well, there's two ways to look at this question. Number one says, well, we had a four-legged, we had a five-legged, we had a six-legged. Changing the number of legs is sort of irrelevant. It's obvious to change the number of legs. It's one way to look at the question. The other way to look at the question is, a three-legged stool never rocks. Put a three-legged stool anywhere, it doesn't rock. It's great, three points. Never rocks. Unexpected, unexpected result. Never expected, we, we get a stool that never rocked. My argument would be, that's patentable. There's something new about that. And actually, that's the kind of arguments as a patent attorney often make. So the three-legged stool, it's new, it's novel, and it's not obvious because it has this unanticipated advantage. Okay, so we get a, we get a patent on the three-legged stool. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a, it's a silly example, but it gives you a feeling of how these rules interact with each other. So often when we go out and work with inventors, what we're often asking you is, one, is it new? What's the delta over what's come before? And then we have to start asking, then we have to play a little more with that question of, well, how much difference does it have an unexpected result? How hard was it to come up with that? What are those differences? Okay? But that's, that's really, in a nutshell, that's really what patent law is. Okay. So it's value. We're only done with the last slide. You, I think we are almost on time, probably within a few moments. You've been very patient. Oh, I was, um, someone asked me to ask this question. How many people here are professors? Any, a few? Um, how many grad students do we have? Ooh, I'm very excited. I want a lot of grad students. And I want you to bring more friends next time. Okay? You get free food. Tell them it's free food, and they, they, the lecture comes along with it. Because um, we really think that for the grad students, you're going to get more out of this, because you're the ones who are going to be going off and doing all kinds of interesting things. The professors are established in their careers. The grad students are going to do really interesting things. We want to help you. Um, OK, what's the value of patents? You can prevent others from using your technology. It gives you market differentiation. You go out in the world, you can do something that nobody else can do. Big advantage, OK? Prevents others. Sometimes you prevent others from patenting. OK? If there's two solutions to a problem, you come in and you, and you say, I got this great solution to the problem. What's the other solution? Well, there's only one other way that you can fix it. Patent both. Because I protect the one that I do, and I prevent anyone else from using the other one. 
Okay? Help myself in the market. Okay? And it provides licensable material. What we do here at the university, you are ventures, is we work with you to think about what can we license out to companies and startups and other people. Big advantage for you, money comes back to the university, comes back to your lab, comes back to you. These are really nice things, okay? But it's, it's quite a terrific thing. So, licensable material, we don't want to let these go out the door. Part of what I wanted to say at the beginning, and I sort of skipped over the slide, is we live in a world with less funding of everything, okay? The more we can leverage our intellectual property to flow back and support labs and support students and do these things, the better off we are as a university. Okay, because we're going to have to do this ourselves more. Unfortunately, the sources out there for funding are, are less, so we need to do more. And this is an important piece of it. Okay. Yes. Who uh, pays for the patenting process if there is an inventor on campus? Does um, the university pay for it? University pays for it. <coughs> university covers that cost. Okay. Now I do have a limited budget. I manage the budget. We have a limited budget, but and we do try to. You know, it is tough because we've got to balance literally the entire university within the budget. But um, this university has made it a serious commitment, much more than other universities, to having a real patent por portfolio. So it really is an asset of the university. Okay. Yes. Question. Could you review uh, quickly the bike patenting, genes, gene products, and so where that stands? Wow. Um, that's such a specialty. I would. Can we bring it up at the next presentation because it's going to be specifically on patenting? Okay, if you could hold it, and I appreciate that. Or if you really want to talk, we can talk after, if you need it more immediately. Yes? Uh, so, to prevent others from using the patent, um, does the using actually imply safety or for more purpose? For Any purpose. And that, oh, yeah, that's a good question, because people always say this. They'll say, oh, I don't have to worry about those intellectual property rights because I'm just doing it for research and development. It's non-commercial. Let me tell you, the patent office makes, and the patent law makes no distinction in infringement. Infringement at a university is infringement, and you can be sued on it, just as you can be sued if you do it for commercial purpose. The only reason that universities don't tend to get sued that much is because the damages and the recovery typically aren't enough to justify the cost. But you are infringing, and you could be stopped. And I tell you, people who come after you like the pharmaceutical companies. If they've got a patent and they think you're doing research that could injure them somehow, they will come after you, even as an individual researcher. Okay, so it does apply to us. There's no, accept, there's no exemption for non-commercial purposes. Copyright has this, has this fair use principle that you know, some things for academic purposes we can do that theoretically are an infringement, but there's, there's this fair use principle that says it's not. That does not apply to patents. It's not applied to trademarks. Okay, yes? So taking your this higher I'm sorry, ask the question again, I apologize. You said the use includes any use, not limited to commercial use. Yes. Take the use is higher example. Yep. If a bike company is made to bike for this tire, and I as an individual buy this tire from target and use it for exercise, I'm using it. Yes. Yes, you, th this is, this is a question. yes, you could be, you, as an individual who bought the tire, could be sued for infringement. Because it's make, use, sell, or offer to sell. So you could get sued for buy, for using the tire. The person you bought it from would get sued for selling and offering to sell. Now what happens in the real world is you almost rarely never sue the end user. You tend to sue the manufacturer. Or the manufacturer steps in and says, I'm going to cover all those suits. Okay? I'm going to cover all those suits. But that's actually it's one of those things. You, you know, you'll have boilerplate and you get an agreement. Often it says, I don't have to cover you when you buy something. Of course they do. Because they, you know, if I'm making tires, I can't have my customers getting sued. So I, effectively, the, the manufacturer steps in. But realistically, you could be sued. Kind of an interesting question. Yes? So since okay. these are nation-specific, is there a whole industry, let's say like in Russia, you find a US patent, they basically hijack it, make the product. Yes. And then the, the, the simple uh, answer is yes. That China China does this. Yeah, China does this all the time. Um, the problem is if it gets if it gets exported back to the US, it may it, it may then be 
um, infringing at that point. But you have to catch it at the border. So this happens all the time. In my old job, we made printer cartridges. We had all kinds of patents on printer cartridges. And in China, you know, they would make a zillion printer cartridges and then try to ship them to the US. And they didn't infringe until they crossed the border. But you have to figure out when they crossed the border. Then they infringe. Then you can start to graph them. OK. You've been very patient. I just want to finish on this. Um, this is the last slide. Um, so keep inventions confidential. Okay, they're, they're a trade secret until we get filing. Time when this matters. First to file system. We want to be, we want to be ex expedious about this. Um, having a patent is not a right to use. I'm sorry I hammered that home, but it's amazing how long, long people get it. Um, if you work anywhere, you want to have an agreement in place. Okay? Just because you fund something does not mean you get the patent. Patents belong to the inventor. Okay? That's, that's the default rule. If there's no agreement in place, they automatically belong to the inventor. Literally, I have had cases where clients of mine funded research done by someone to create something, started to make the product, and the person who they funded came after them for patent infringement. And you stand there with an executive going, God damn it, I paid for that. The answer is, you didn't have an agreement in place. You don't have the rights. They're the inventor. They have the rights. And they are fully entitled to come after you, even though you funded them. It stinks, but that's the way the world works. So make sure you have an agreement in place. These real world, these happen all the time. Yes? So in the university, uh, so you said in the university, Facebook had filing and all this stuff. So who owns that? University. You would, as part of your employment agreement, because you actually, as a grad student, you have to have an employment agreement, you assign all of your rights and inventions to the university. Okay? When you sign that, that employment agreement, when you got hired, I signed it. So if I invent something in the course of my work, I'm not sure what I'm going to invent doing my job, but um, it would so be university. In the course of your work, if it's not in the course of your work, this gets, this gets to be a trickier question. Some companies will come after you because New York actually theoretically allows an employer to take any invention you have at any moment. Um, Minnesota and California don't allow that, and as a practical matter, it would be, if, if you talk to general counsel, they'll say that it's difficult to get something that's really out of the scope of. If I go home and I invent a better light bulb, it has nothing to do with the university, it's going to be pretty hard to enforce that. But not impossible. But what if you have someone who's a computer programmer who's an employee of the university? Uh, and then, yeah. On the weekends, they do computer programming and they come up with a Yeah, and that, this is where it gets tricky because the, the argument pretty, pretty much is that is something within the scope of your employment. Even if you did it on the weekend, they probably own it and they have a good case for it. Yeah. Well, Xerox would definitely argue that. I mean, yes. The university, the university is actually a much nicer place to work when it comes to those things. One, one question the university would ask is, yeah, and I think that for the university, that's often the question. If you issue computer, but you know, if you're using your lab, then it's up. Yeah, if you do it in your lab or somewhere else, uh, the university is going to assert their rights. If you really did it outside, um, the university is a pretty reasonable place. Okay, um, don't give away rights. Understand the consequences of agreements. When you, when you are doing research, think about what if I create intellectual property, patents, or anything else? Who's going to own it? What's going to happen to it? How do we divide it? You want to lay that out before you do the research. Trying to do it after is always a disaster. Because now everybody thinks they're going to get rich, and it's almost impossible to come to an agreement. Okay? You've been incredibly patient. I appreciate this. I hope you get more. It's a good group today. Next one is um, patents and the patenting process. October 21, there'll be more food. We'll be here again Tuesday, same time. Yes, I will we'll figure out a way to post the slide to do something. Yeah. 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 Well, we <laughs> so the entire series is listed both on the UR Ventures website, also on the college research site, and we can actually post the yeah, we'll, we'll, slide there. I'll make sure.